Hello and welcome to the IPNFA Online Congress 2021. My name is Marcel Cervellus. I'm physical therapist from Germany and IPNFA senior instructor. I have the honor to start this year's lectures and my topic will be about irradiation. So please follow me and I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you. So, hello, and let's start with a presentation. Okay, just a moment. So, let's go. You stop it here. Irradiation, the tool for a targeted indirect treatment in the PNF concept. When you talk to therapists about PNF, many colleagues are associating PNF with PNF patterns. PNF, uh, these are these funny movements, isn't it? Uh, PNF, um, this is only patterns. The most famous is probably the arm pattern of flexion, abduction, external rotation. Actually, we have 42 patterns. So beside the arm patterns, there are patterns for the scapula, the pelvis, the trunk, and for the lower extremities. When I talk to my personal trainer, he will say this. Oh, PNF? Ah, these are these nice stretching techniques, isn't it? For many of them, PNF is just the synonym for the two techniques of hold relax and contract relax. So checking the literature, you will find there are lots of articles and studies showing the evidence for the effectiveness of these two techniques. But also here we have eight other techniques for different purposes than stretching. Besides patterns and techniques, we have a philosophy and basic principles and procedures. These are the four cornerstones which are forming the PNF concept. So independent from the position where we are working, the goal is to improve the patient's participation. So when you deal with PNF, sooner or later you will come across the term of irradiation. And for this we should go back into history. So let's go to the roots of PNF. PNF goes back to the work of Dr. Hermann Cabot and Maggie Knott. Cabot's intention was to translate scientific knowledge into clinical practice, which means the neurophysiology as known at that time, was the base to develop techniques and procedures in order to improve motor control. I think Sherrington mentioned irradiation already. Sherrington, he described in 1906 already irradiation as a spread of reflex responses about a focus. In an article of 1953, Cabot is defining irradiation as a natural and automatic result of an effective muscle contraction, such as it is produced by resistive exercises. Voss, Jonta and Myers are talking about a spread of muscle activity. And nowadays in the IPNFA, we define irradiation as a spread of excitations within the nervous system to stimulate muscle contractions in other parts of the body. Which means we have here a patient we can resist on the arm and as a result of this resisted exercise we might see some action in the calf muscle of the opposite leg. So irradiation can be used to stimulate the patient in a way that he is using other parts of the body and we call that indirect treatment. In the daily therapy you can observe very often following. 
You're asking the patient to press down one knee in order to stimulate the quadriceps and at the same time simultaneously the patient is contracting the quadriceps on the opposite limb. Some people will call it associated movement and in the literature you find very often the terms of cross-lateral effect, contralateral transfer, cross-training, cross-education. And there is a study from 1894 which was showing at that time already that a unilateral training is showing a strength increase on the opposite limb. So let's go for unilateral training. We save a lot of time. In a meta-analysis from 2004 by Mann, 12 studies were cited and all but one showed this increase of strength on the opposite limb. Certainly we have therapeutic situations where we can make use of this effect, especially in the sense of reinforcement, but I like to put a question mark at this point here and draw the attention to the functional approach of irradiation. Isaac Newton, the Bali impender, and why some fishermen use outriggers. This gentleman here, who looks like a rock musician from the 1970s, is Isaac Newton, who lived actually 300 years ago. This is a so-called Bali impender. It's a device for physical exercises, so you can train your upper extremity with it. To avoid any rumors, Newton did not invent the Bali impender. Actually, Newton was describing the laws of mechanics. Newton's third law is saying that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So this guy here is trying to roll the rock uphill. The rock exerts a force opposite to the direction of the push of the person. In order to be stable, the person needs to push himself into the ground and we have a ground reaction force in the opposite direction. If nobody's moving, all these forces are balanced and equal. This is the Bali impender. It's an exercise tool which you can use to strengthen your upper extremities. Basically it consists of a spring with two handles. And you press these two handles together and you strengthen your pectoral muscles, for example. And what is the connection to the PNF patterns? Here we see the end position of the flexion abduction internal rotation pattern with knee flexion. The starting position would look like this and during the pattern the patient moves into the end position. Here we see the pattern in the dynamic. In the therapy usually the patient works against the resistance of the therapist. All the components of the patterns are now active which means that the patient is now responding with a flexor abductor internal rotator activity with knee flexor and dorsiflexor and pronator activity. On the opposite leg we can see that the patient will start to push into the table. So let's analyze these reactions with the help of the Bali impanda. The flexor component of the pattern will be answered with the extensor activity. In the frontal plane, the internal rotator activity at the end of range will be answered by the abductors of the left leg. In the coronal plane at the end of range of the pattern, the abduction or horizontal abduction will produce an external rotator activity in the opposite hip. Summarizing the reactions, we will have hip extensor, abductor and external rotator activity as a reaction to the pattern. This combination 
is used very often in daily life activities as during gait, loading response, early mid stance, sit to stand, going upstairs, downstairs. So anytime we have a weight bearing situation with the unlocked knee, the leg alignment has to be stabilized with these muscles, which are anatomically the upper gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius and minimus. In this little EMG setup, we have the uh, in the upper box we see the uh, activity of the gluteus maximus and in the lower activity the gluteus medius as a response on the flexion abduction internal rotation pattern with knee flexion on the opposite side. How can this be used in a therapy? Let's take a look at a real patient. Here we have a patient after ACL reconstruction. The patient uh, is allowed for 20 kilos of weight bearing. It's two weeks post surgery. So I'm applying the flexion abduction internal rotation pattern with knee flexion. So first showing the patient the movement and here we switch into the technique of agonistic reversal. So you can see here that she is pushing her left foot into the scale against the wall and is stabilizing the left leg. Now here we have a different setup, side lying on the right side. The affected leg is in extension with the foot against the wall. So I'm applying a scapular anterior elevation pattern. The setup is suitable to prepare mid stance, late mid stance or the beginning of terminal stance. On top I'm applying ulnar thrust in order to stimulate more the whole muscle chain and to get more reactions on the foot. Side lying on the affected side with the affected leg in front will prepare initial contact and loading response and the resistance on the right side of the pelvis will stimulate knee extensor activity. So this was about the force and counterforce issue and actually uh, very often when we apply PNF there is one more component in it and this is what I'm going to talk now about. External forces and keeping the balance. So when we talk about balance uh, we need to use the term also of postural control and postural control actually is defined differently depending on the author. So I'm referring to the definition of Shamway Cook and Volokat and they are describing postural control as a, a composition about posture or postural orientation and the balance or postural stability. Posture means keeping a biomechanical alignment while Balance means that you have to keep the center of gravity or the center of body mass over the base of support. When you talk about postural control, you come quickly to the aspect of motor control and the same authors, they are describing motor control as the coordination between the individual situation the environment and the task which has to be accomplished. So when we look at this patient here, this patient is trying to fix his shoes and uh, the individual situation is that he has a hemiplegia, which means he can use his left side, left arm, left extremity fairly well. Additionally, his right leg can move, so you can see he can lift it up but he has some problems controlling the arm and presumably also some problems on the trunk. His environment is consisting about uh, the contact on the seat and the contact of his left foot on the ground. And there is one more point and that is gravity as a permanent force acting on him. And he has to coordinate all his action 
with these external forces and with his internal properties and with his restrictions. Of course, his second intention is that he will not fall off the bench. Here we have a fishing boat. The fishing boat has a sail and a very narrow trunk. In order to sail, you need wind. The wind will blow into the sail, but unfortunately, the wind will tilt the boat, the boat will run full of water and finally drown. The sharks will be happy about some visitors. We can compare this situation to a patient performing a pattern without the necessary stability. In the southwest Pacific, like Indonesia, Philippines, you can find these traditional fishing boats. These fishing boats have outriggers. The outriggers act as a stabilizer. So the outrigger has a buoyancy which will keep the outrigger upwards and stabilize the boat when the wind is blowing into the sail. When we compare this to a therapeutic situation, here we have a model in side lying, which is a very instable position. And the model is supposed to push against the resistance of the therapist into extension and abduction internal rotation with the right leg. To avoid that she is rolling into prone, she needs to stabilize herself with the other extremities in front. So she is using the opposite leg or the arms as outriggers and can stabilize this sideline position while pushing against the therapist. Depending which is the target limb, the therapist has to change the setup of the working position. So in case the opposite leg would be the target, it would be good to take out the arms as potential stabilizers. So the irradiation will go only into the leg. If the left arm is the target, the opposite leg should be in extension, so behind the side midline, and the right arm should be placed accordingly. Since the left arm is now the only stabilizing device, we will stimulate here by irradiation an activity into flexion and horizontal abduction. And for the right arm, we should place the left arm under the head and then we can stimulate a flexor adductor activity in the right shoulder. Oh, we have a phone call. Okay, just a moment. Oh, IPNFA Irradiation Center, how can I help you? Good day, Marcel. Max here from Australia. How's it going? Just a quick question for you. Is irradiation only happening when applying PNF? Thanks, mate. Appreciated. Actually not. Uh, let me show you one example here. Oh, wait, here. Let's go. Here we have a person in standing. The center of body mass is directly over the ankle joint, which means there is no torque in the ankle joint. With a natural sway, which we have normally, a little bit forward, a little bit sidewards, the plumb line in relation to the ankle joint will move. So in case the center of body mass is moving forward, we will see that the plumb line is anterior of the ankle joint. This will create torque into dorsiflexion, which will be answered by this person with the activity of the plantar flexors. Depending on the amount of translation forward and also depending on the alignment of the rest of the body, it may be necessary that the whole dorsal muscle chain will get active. So what will happen if we apply a resistance from dorsal? The addition of the horizontal force plus gravity 
will project a force to the forefoot. The reactions of this person will be the same as in the natural sway. The plantar flexors will get active and depending on the situation maybe the dorsal muscle chain. So mechanically it doesn't make a difference if the center of body mass is moving and creating a torque or if an external force like a manual resistance is producing this torque. The person has to react in order to maintain the balance. So when we come back to our knee patient from before, we can use this principle also in higher position. Additionally to our manual resistance, gravity will become more and more effective. The high sitting position combined with the trunk extension pattern and the technique of agonistic reversal will stimulate hip extensor, knee extensor and plantar flexor activity. So a little change in the setup here in a high one leg sitting situation will increase the weight bearing on the left foot. The half standing situation resembles to normal standing or to situations like uh, mid stance. And here we can already prepare activity level very close to what the patient needs to do later. Since gravity now here is in the same line as in the real life situation. Using anterior elevation pattern of the pelvis or of the scapula can facilitate a mid-stance coordination pattern. Depending on the focus of the treatment, so which body function, which activity we want to improve, we can choose different setups and stimulate the affected limb in a very functional way to prepare activity. In respect of motor learning, this is a very accepted way to improve the performance of the patient. Just one more thing in respect of the balance issue for the completeness. The outrigger model is suitable to explain how a person is stabilizing herself or himself by pushing against the floor, pushing against the wall, holding on a heavy object. But there is a different strategy available and this is also being used, but it has some limitations. Yachtsmen or sailors they know that you can stabilize a boat by using your body weight and leaning out on the windward side. The limitation of this strategy is the available body weight. So in the sitting situation, when the resistance is coming from anterior, there is no possibility to push against the environment. So this model is using the body weight of the legs and of the arms in flexion or here in the frontal plane with side bending of the trunk and rotation of the hips. And if we apply a diagonal resistance we can see reactions which are resembling of PNF patterns. But this is a different story. So, irradiation is nothing but balance reactions. Balance is just one aspect of irradiation. But there is another point which we should take a look at. And this is about how movements are being organized. And here, irradiation plays an important role. Moving selectively. The question is... Why does the dog wag its tail and not the tail wag the dog? We have to bother Isaac Newton again. Isaac Newton defined force as a product of mass and acceleration. So the acceleration will be depending on the applied force and the body mass. And this is related to each other. Here we have a little lorry 
and the force will be able to accelerate this lorry. Underneath we have two lorries, so double body mass but the same force. As a consequence, the same force will now produce half the acceleration of the two lorries. This little video will explain how force, acceleration and body mass are related to each other. The little gentleman we can see here is Maurice. He's 10 years old and his body weight is 20 kilos. His friend Jan has same age, same body weight. Both are sitting on a bobby car each and a TheraBand is attached between these two bobby cars. Bobby cars are little plastic cars on which the kids can sit and push themselves around. Now the TheraBand is under tension and on a signal both will lift up the feet. The TheraBand will exert the force on both cars and both guys at the same time. And as they have the same body mass, the acceleration will be the same. If we attach an additional bobby car on one side with Mati on it, we have an unequal situation. Okay, two guys on the left hand side, Maurice only on the right hand side. So the TheraBand will exert his force on both sides in the same matter, but the acceleration will be different. If Maurice is now holding himself on this water pipe and the water pipe is connected to the wall and the wall is connected to the rest of the earth. Okay, we have now changed the relation of body masses from the left side to a bigger body mass on the right hand side. On the signal, they lift the feet and you can see we could change punctum fixum and punctum mobile. Here we have a model of a muscular skeletal unit. So it consists of two bones, one joint and one muscle, which is the force generator. The attachment of the muscle in relation to the joint does not matter so much as long as the situation is out of the impact of gravity. If the muscle is now contracting, it will accelerate both joint partners in the same style. Normally, joint partners are not of equal body mass, which means we have a big joint partner and a smaller one. A contraction of the muscle will now move the smaller partner while the bigger partner stays more or less stable in its place. Here we have a little model. So two sticks, one rubber band and a joint, a hinge in between. The rubber band is under tension and if I let go, the two sticks will move in the same style. If we exchange one joint partner for a smaller one, refix the rubber band and then you will see that the smaller joint partner is accelerated fastly while the bigger one moves just a little bit. Now I'm putting a stone on the smaller joint partner so I'm changing the relation uh, between these two. We will see that the acceleration will now go to the long stick while the stone stays on the place. If we apply this on a situation the person is in supine and wants to lift the leg. So for lifting the leg the hip flexors are necessary and an isolated hip flexor activity will lead to following situation. The pelvis is tilting and the leg stays on the surface. This situation we can see very often with patients with a functional lumbar instability. In order to move the leg, 
the body needs to organize a different relation of body masses. This is achieved by connecting the pelvis via the abdominals with the thoracic cage. So now the trunk is a solid block with a higher body mass and the activity of the hip flexors is now going into a movement of the leg. This example shows the significance of a functional muscle chain in respect of a functional stability. An alternative strategy could be to connect the pelvis with the opposite leg and if the opposite leg can use the surface with the extensor activity then the pelvis will be also stable enough and the hip flexor activity will be able to move the leg. This situation we had before with the Bali impenda. In real life, probably both strategies are being used in order to economize the muscular activities. An additional resistance will lead to an increased recruitment of muscular activities on the proximal side. As a therapeutic exercise, more on body function level, this effect could be used here, asking the patient to stabilize actively the lumbar spine by activating the transverse abdominis and applying resistance here with the technique of stabilizing reversal will lead to adaptation in the trunk uh, in order to achieve or maintain the stability. Here we have a patient with a functional instability of the scapula and you can see that the scapula is swinging out when he's lifting the arm or when he is lowering the arm. Just watch a moment. Here, tuck, the scapula wings out. The resisted bilateral flexion at 90 degrees shows the problems the patient has in the stabilization of the scapula on the thoracic cage. A resisted external rotation here in sitting shows the same symptom. To explain what's happening, I'm resisting external rotation. So the patient will push against me with his external rotators and the activity of the external rotators will start to pull on the humerus for the external rotation but the proximal attachment will pull on the scapula. So in case there is no stabilization the scapula will wing out. In order to stabilize the scapula the connections between the scapula and the thorax or respectively the spine, has to be active. So let's take a look at some treatment examples. So after some warm-up exercises, we can focus on the scapular awareness, which means we are working locally here with the scapula using a stabilizing technique. So the patient needs to get an idea where the scapula is, how he can activate the scapula controlling muscles. Here we see the stabilizing reversal. On top of this scapula stabilization, I'm now adding the upper extremity, using the arm here with an extension abduction pattern as this will facilitate the lower trapeze very nicely. So I'm going off with my right hand with the resistance giving some tactile feedback for the scapula position and gradually we will start to work with the arm dynamically while the scapula stays in the desired position. Now the view from a different angle. So you can see here the extension abduction pattern plus a resisted scapular posterior depression. 
And I'm working dynamically with the arm using the technique of agonistic reversal. Some people call it combination of isotonics while the scapula is staying in its position in a posterior depression. In the progression, I'm taking off my resistance at the scapula, stimulating only with my fingers, giving a feedback for the position of the scapula before we change into a different position. Here, prone and elbows, advantage of this position is that we additionally can activate the serratus anterior muscle, a very important muscle for the scapular stabilization together with the lower trapeze. I'm resisting on the arms here for external rotation and this will stimulate the scapular stabilizers via irradiation. Now in the sitting position we are using the same principles. So controlling the scapula while the arm is active, moving or holding. The stimulation of the scapular control is slowly being reduced. So from a resisted situation I slowly go into a just tactile stimulation and finally take my hands off the scapula while the patient is still active with the humerus. So in this phase of the treatment, so basically we are doing motor learning here, a verbal feedback can be very useful when the other stimuli like resistance and manual contact are being taken out. In PNF we have the technique of replication and replication is covering the gap between hands on and hands off, giving the patient a perception about the muscular activity which is necessary by resisting on the scapula here in this example and then repeating the whole thing without the resistance and with an independent control. So we see here again, I'm resisting on the arm and on the scapula and then asking the patient to move the arm against resistance and taking care of the scapula by himself. Once the patient has good perception about the control of the scapula, we can go for training like here with a resisted external rotation bilaterally. In the post-test we can see here a much much better stabilization of the scapula. The patient has to concentrate himself to do the correct movement but he is able to control the scapula in a nice way. So here in direct comparison, the post-test on the left and the pre-test on the right. If we want to put this into relation to Fitz and Posner's three stages of motor learning model, we could see it like this. The cognitive stage of motor learning could be related to a direct treatment, so local hands-on treatment. The autonomous or automatic stage of motor learning would be the hands-off exercises. The link in between can be built by indirect treatment, so using irradiation. Ooh, another phone call. Ah, who is it this time? From Heidelberg. Hello, Hannah. How can I Hello. My question is, or I'm asking myself, what is actually the benefit of working with irradiation? Thank you very much for this question. I'm sure that many therapists will be wondering about the same thing. The decision to include indirect treatment, to include irradiation in the therapy, can have different reasonings. This can be, for example, a pain patient and you want to distract the patient from the painful area over the integration of affected body parts into the body scheme, which is putting the body part into a functional context. 
One more aspect I like to point out here. From sports or physical education, we know that the selection of exercises and the training is depending on the activity which has to be improved. So, a short distance sprinter is not well advised uh, to train with long distance running. And a rock climber, maybe we would not suggest to do ballistic dynamic movements. So, if we analyze an activity which is our treatment goal for our patient, we should consider how the affected body parts are being used during the performance of the activity. This is in which positions or range are the joints moving or uh, staying? Is a concentric, eccentric or static muscle activity necessary to perform the activity? How are external forces acting upon this patient during the activity? We have to check out all these little things and uh, here we have different parameters uh, with which we can make a exercise treatment application uh, very close to activity level in, by including a lot of these elements or we are far away uh, and work mainly on a body function level. But there is a grading in between depending how much we will include. So in this context, what would be the position of irradiation? And here we come to one more point, and this is the way of activation. When we move our body, when we use our body, there are basically two types of activation possible. So one would be a volitional movement, so a voluntary movement, I'm thinking about it, I control it, and the other one are these unvolitional or automatic movements or activities. And uh, when we analyze daily life activities, we will find out that this voluntary part is very small compared to what has to be done in the background when we are moving. The neurophysiology is distinguishing between two systems, the pyramidal system and the extrapyramidal system. The pyramidal system consists of the motor cortex with a homunculus, the guy with a big hand, big mouth and tongue, and the pyramidal tract which is going down to the second motor neuron and there the impulse from the motor cortex is going down to the second motor neuron and then it's being switched to the peripheral nerve and then triggering the muscle contraction. So this is one part. This part is mainly responsible for volitional movements, so movements under control. The extrapyramidal system is the bigger part and the most important part. So here we have the cerebellum, which is responsible for accuracy of movements. We have the uh, different reflex loops on the spinal cord level. We have basal ganglia making sure that the muscles are smooth and also the brainstem integrating all the different information including the vestibular system and making sure that the posture and postural control is accurate. All these things are happening in the background, very automatic and we are not aware about what's going to happen, what is happening and what we have to do. If I have a problem with an ankle stabilization like when I'm walking upstairs, this stabilization is happening during this push-off automatically. I'm not thinking I have to stabilize my ankle joint. So in case there is a stability problem of this ankle joint, it would make sense to train this reactively. In the treatment progression, of course, we can start doing some plantar flexion, uh, pronation movement. We can include it in a nice extension, abduction, internal rotation pattern. We can emphasize this by timing for emphasis. But still, at this level, the patient will think about moving 
the ankle joint using the peroneal muscles. But in the real life, in the during gait, during walking upstairs, jumping, whatever happens, we have to react. And then it makes sense to train this reaction. So we make the patient active with the upper extremities, for example, bring him in a position where this joint is in a from joint position in a functional situation, and then train this reaction. And there we can grade depending on the impact of our resistance, depending on the position of the patient, when gravity is adding to it, uh, we can slowly go closer and closer to the activity level. So in PNF, we are addressing this extra pyramidal system when we apply irradiation. And I think this is a very smart thing. So PNF is cool and working with irradiation is so smart. The take home messages. Irradiation is an essential feature of motor control, either as a requirement for a balance, postural control, or as a base for a selective motor behavior and functional stability. In the treatment progression, irradiation can be a smart tool. So from body function, body structure level to activity level and from hands on to hands off therapy. Thank you for your attention. So this is the end of the presentation. I hope you liked it. If you have any comments, feedback, question, whatever, the address to contact me is below. And tomorrow we will have a presentation about PNF in geriatrics. I'm presuming it will not be about IPNFA senior instructors. The author is Leandro Giacometti from Porto Alegre, Brazil. So don't forget to get online tomorrow. Stay healthy. Take care. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Tomorrow we travel to Porto Alegre in Brazil.